Absolutely. Second question, okay? We've done this series on Revelation, and you fellows have talked about the rapture could happen any moment. People want to know, how do you know that it could happen any moment, and what's this word mean that you've used a couple times called imminent? Where do you have a Bible basis for talking about the rapture could happen at any time? Well, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he talks about this and says, in a moment, in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. So something related to the coming of Christ has to happen quickly, suddenly, instantly. And throughout the book of Revelation, seven times you have that phrase, I'll come quickly, I'll come quickly. It's as though he comes and snatches away the church, and that could potentially happen at any moment. Well, when we use the word imminent, we're not meaning that it's immediate necessarily. What we're saying is there's nothing else that has to happen before the rapture takes place. So uh, the rapture is an event that is certain to take place, but it's uncertain when it will happen. It, uh, it's kind of like uh, the big one that everyone's waiting for out in California, you know, this big earthquake that's going to come. Everybody knows it's coming, but no one knows when it's going to happen. So it's an imminent event. It's an event that can take place at any time. And this is really borne out in the scriptures in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Uh, Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. And he says, You turned uh, to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven who delivers us uh, from the wrath to come. And uh, the, the word that's used there, to wait, literally means to wait up for. Uh, we're to wait up for His Son from heaven. And if you're waiting up for someone, then the idea is that they could come at any point in time. And it says there too that He's coming to deliver us from this coming wrath, from this time of wrath that's coming in the tribulation. So this also supports the idea that His coming will be before uh, this time of wrath that's coming on the earth. Yeah. I think also um, in Revelation 3.10, it talks about how the church will be delivered from the hour of trial that is to come. Now, I want you to understand that it's the time period that we are to be delivered from, not just tribulation. It's not as if God is going to sustain us through a period of tribulation, but rather the church will be kept out of the period of tri tribulation. It's the Greek word ek, which means out of. So the church will be kept out of the period of tribulation. And John, this is distinct from general tribulation. All of us as Christians experience general tribulation. Life is tough sometimes, but that's distinct from this period of tribulation that's coming on the earth. And all the verses that deal with the rapture talk about how we're going to be delivered from that time before it even begins. Addressing the subject of a pre-tribulational rapture, a pre-tribulational rapture, its proponents believe 
that the Lord can return at any time generally, but that it must take place before the final seven years, at least by the lunar calendar of human history, which most of them equate to the 70th week of Daniel's vision and prophecy from Daniel chapter 9, the 70th seven of Daniel, that is the last seven lunar years of history. It must happen before then, and they define this period as the Great Tribulation and say the rapture must happen before that time, and most of them say the Lord can come at any time in anticipation of these final seven years. The first issue is, what is the Great Tribulation? It will indeed be a unique time. Jesus made it clear nothing that bad has ever happened before, nor will anything that terrible happen again. Some people, some radical preterists, have suggested that these events predicted by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Luke 21, had their complete and total fulfillment in 70 AD, the events surrounding the destruction of the Second Temple, and that the events recorded in Josephus describe what happened and we should look for no future meaning. The book of Revelation does not have a meaning for the future. It has all happened in the first century. This, of course, would be impossible. Daniel chapter 12 and Jesus himself in the Olivet Discourse made it very clear nothing this bad will have happened before and nothing so terrible will transpire again. The fact of the matter is, as tumultuous as those events of 70 AD were in the first century, worse things have happened both to Israel and the Jews and to the church. Worse things than 70 AD have happened to Israel and to the church. What we see happening today in the Middle East is setting the stage for what Zechariah predicted would see two-thirds of the Jews ultimately killed in their own land when they make a covenant with death with the Antichrist. But the Holocaust of the 1930s and 40s was considerably worse than 70 AD in terms of the numbers of Jews and others who were killed at that particular time. Bar Kokhba's rebellion in the second century, the events around 120 AD were worse than what happened in the first century at 70 AD. Christianity similarly. Horrific things happened under the Roman emperors, under Domitian, Diocletian, under Marcus Aurelius, Septimus Severitus, Nero. Unspeakable things. Unspeakable things have happened to the church throughout history, and more Christians have been martyred for their faith probably in the last 50 to 75 years than in all of the recorded history of the church put together. There is no way that the Great Tribulation can be a past event, something that already happened in the first century, as radical preterists say. Those events of the first century are a shadow or a type, a foreshadowing of what is going to transpire at the end of the age, but they are not the Great Tribulation. The word tribulation in Greek, however, is thelipsis, thelipsis. True believers have usually suffered tribulation throughout the church's history. True believers have generally suffered thelipsis, tribulation, throughout the history of the church. Admittedly, however, we have the superlative adjective, great tribulation, something unique will take place at the end. However, no place does Jesus or the apostles ever say that the great tribulation equals the entire seven-year period. In fact, when we read the Olivet Discourse consecutively as Jesus spoke it, we see that the great tribulation is preceded by a period called the beginning of birth pangs or the beginning of sorrows. Thinking of maternal birth, the baby doesn't come all at once. First, there are contractions with interim periods of respite before the final push when the baby arrives, corresponding to the arrival of the man-child in Revelation chapter 12. The scripture uses obstetrics, medical obstetrics, as a frequent illustration of what's going to happen at the end of the age. Birth pangs increase before the rapture and the uh, return of Jesus. Nonetheless, 
we have the beginning of birth pangs or the beginning of sorrows, as some translate it, and then we have the great tribulation. However, we are not appointed to wrath. The word philipsis is not the same as the word for wrath. The word for wrath is orge, orge, and we are not appointed for wrath. There'll be an hour of testing coming, the Greek word for that being peresmos, but the wrath of God is something that the faithful church will not experience. They will be removed prior to it. But no place does the scripture specifically say that the church is going to be removed before the great tribulation. It just doesn't say it. On the contrary, if you read the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Jesus spoke of persecution of the believers taking place at that time. Now, some people have given themselves a license to say that means the tribulation saints, the rapture will have already happened before that time. On what basis can they say that? On no basis can they say that. No basis whatsoever. Let's look at the words of the Lord Jesus himself in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. He speaks of these things, but he says in verse 21, for then there will be a great tribulation, such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. Basically echoing Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And unless those days had been cut short, a surgical term, kolobo, kolobo, a cutting short, like a surgical amputation in Greek, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be cut short. In other words, the elect will still be here. And by an act of divine surgical intervention, as it were, the faithful church will be removed. Then he warns believers, if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. And he goes on speaking of this. But then in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Now all of these things involving cosmic phenomena may have a literal meaning, certainly. They, they may literally take place in the cosmos, but they are figurative of things taking place spiritually. For instance, arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the risen Lord is brighter than the sun. In the great darkness at the end of the age, the light of Jesus will not be seen. The moon has no light of its own. The moon only reflects the light of the sun. The church will not reflect the light of Jesus. Stars will fall from the sky. Abraham's descendants are called the stars of heaven. Just as a third of the angels followed Satan, we see a third of the stars swept from heaven in Revelation. There'll be a great falling away at the end of the age. Again, these literal cosmic phenomena have spiritual meanings because they are illustrating things. What's taking place in the cosmos are illustrations of what's transpiring spiritually at the same time. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. This goes to Zechariah chapter 12. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with the sky, power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great trumpet and gather together his elect from the four winds, one end of the sky to the other. On what basis can someone give themselves a license to say, that's the tribulation saints, that's not talking about us or believers, we're gone. No, it's talking about the elect. You have no basis to say that that's people who've already missed the rapture. The elect don't miss the rapture. They have no basis to say that whatsoever. Nothing in the exegetical context will allow them to say it. It's only their presupposition. Their presupposition is that philipsis equals orge, that tribulation equals the wrath of God. The faithful church does not experience the orge, the wrath of God. But believers have always experienced tribulation 
and they will be here during the Great Tribulation. But the Great Tribulation, we cannot in any sense conclude, is the entirety of the seven years. Hence, when you see people saying things like pre-trib, they usually mean pre-seven years. When people say mid-trib, they usually mean halfway through the seven years. And when people say post-trib, they mean after the seven years. You cannot exegetically prove at all that the tribulation is the entirety of the seven years, but only a portion of it. The beginning of birth pangs is the first section. The great tribulation is the second. The day of the Lord, when the wrath of God is poured out on the kingdom of Antichrist, after the faithful church is removed, that is the third. First, second, third. Beginning of birth pangs, great tribulation, the day of the Lord, that is the day of his wrath. To equate the Great Tribulation with the entirety of the seven years has no exegetical basis whatsoever. It's something people concocted. And they've concocted the idea that what it says about gathering the elect not being the rapture, the elect are already gone, they have no basis to say that either. None. Not exegetically. It's simply a deductive opinion. Among my pre-tribulational friends, there are multiple views of this particular passage of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll read it in English. We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Episunagage, that is our gathering around him. We get the word synagogue, same root in Greek. That you be not quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as God. Again, in our recording, A House Divided, we explain how the pre-tribulational position is fragmenting, how many of its proponents do not agree with each other. Now let me point out, I have much common ground with many pre-tribulationists, even though my own view is not pre-tribulational. My position, is a rapture that takes place between the sixth and seventh seal. That is an intra-seal rapture. It's somewhat similar to pre-wrath, except that I agree with the pre-tribulationists that it is the Holy Spirit who was the restrainer. It is not an angel, as pre-wrath people, I believe, mistakenly say. I agree with the pre-tribulationists. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit. Nonetheless, I do place the rapture where most pre-wrath people do. Be that as it may, let's understand how this passage is interpreted by various pre-tribulational people. One of the most respected Messianic Bible teachers in the world and a personal favorite of mine, as well as a personal friend and brother, is Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Arnold Fruchtenbaum correctly states that the Great Tribulation will not take place until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. I agree with Dr. Fruchtenbaum. The Great Tribulation will not take place until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. He is correct. I also agree with pre-tribulational brethren who say that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. Of course, I do not agree that when the Holy Spirit is taken, that equals the rapture. That is not my position. Jesus breathed on the apostles after his resurrection and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But then the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was already within the hearts of the apostles 
who were at that time regenerate. But the Holy Spirit had not empowered the church to preach Jesus and to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. I do not believe the Holy Spirit will ever leave the hearts of God's people who are truly his, but I do believe the Holy Spirit will be taken from the world. But that does not equate to the rapture. Our belief is that the same as there was a period between the Ascension and Pentecost, there will be a period between the restrainer being taken and the return of Jesus, the rapture, the resurrection, the episunigage, the parousia. There's a gap period, both in the book of Acts and at the last days. The apostles already had the Holy Spirit indwelling, but the Holy Spirit was not yet empowering the church or convicting the world. The reverse happens at the end of the age. We cannot equate the restrainer being removed with the rapture. God's people can be here and still have the Holy Spirit without the Holy Spirit restraining the power of Satan to keep the Antichrist from coming to power. In the Old Testament, for instance, certain people at certain times, high priests, kings, patriarchs, judges, and prophets all have the Holy Spirit as individuals. Yet, this was well before the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. So too, the apostles as individuals had the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit was poured out. The idea that the Holy Spirit being taken from the world equals the Holy Spirit being taken by means of the rapture is something that is just not supportable from anything in Scripture. It's something that people invented. Nonetheless, let's look at this idea of the apostasy, the apostasia. I do agree with those pre-tribulationists who say the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. And I agree with my friend Dr. Arno Fruchtenbaum that the identity of the man of lawlessness, the anthropon enomon, will have to be revealed to the faithful church before the great tribulation. He's right. I also agree totally with Dr. Mark Hitchcock, excellent debater, that if the apostasy was the rapture itself, the word would be harpezo, rapture, snatching away, but it is not. Unfortunately, not all pre-tribulationists are as biblically grounded as solid or as sensible as Dr. Hitchcock or Dr. Fruchtenbaum. We have people within the pre-tribulational camp who are teaching something that has never been a majority opinion or scarcely even a minority opinion, if that. They are rather teaching that the rapture is the apostasy, the apostasy that Paul is speaking of is the rapture. Now this is complete and utter nonsense. In order to formulate the basis for this proposition, they say that the term is virtually a hapex legemini. It's something that only occurs one place in scripture. Strictly speaking, that is not the case. And they cite an underlying root Greek word, epistemi, meaning to stand out. This term epistemi, and its case-ending variations, is a term used, for instance, when John Mark departed from the mission team of Paul and Barnabas. He departed. Hence, because there is an etymologically related Greek word, apostemi, that is related etymologically to apostasia, to apostasy, that becomes their basis. This is silly. They are etymologically related, but they're not the same word. The word here has the prefix apo, out of, apo. Where else does Paul use this term? Well, let's begin, first of all, by pointing out that he uses it in the same epistle as a prefix in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. He says the following, 
Apopantos Adelphos, outside of every brother. Well, he's of course speaking of morally reprobate brethren, Christians who are living some kind of backslidden lives, apparently. We command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. Away from every brother. Apo, Pantos, Adelpho. Apo, there's the prefix. Same prefix as an apostasia, apostasy. But in an eschatological, prophetic, last days context, we read the following in 1 Timothy chapter 4. But the Spirit explicitly, that is emphatically, says that in the latter times, the end of the age, some will fall away from the faith. They will apostatize. The term here is apostasantai. Same word, merely a case variation. They will apostatize in the last days. We interpret scripture in light of scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 4 is telling us what is going to transpire within the church in the last days. There will be an apostasy. It says it directly. The same word used in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This harmonizes exactly with what Jesus warns us of in the Olivet Discourse. Many will fall away, betray one another. How persons like Thomas Ice can exegetically or linguistically concoct this fanciful fabricated idea that the rapture is the apostasy makes very little sense to anyone, including to most other credible pre-tribulational scholars. I know many pre-tribulationists. They don't believe that the rapture is the apostasy. Many people in the pre-trib research organization don't believe it. A probable majority don't believe it. It really, really lacks substantial foundation in terms of etymology, linguistic argumentation, or exegesis. The text, in context, in light of code texts speaking of the same thing, all confirm the apostasy is a falling away from the truth. Let us look at the context of 2 Thessalonians in the last days. We read the following. The lawless one, the anthropon enomon, the man of lawlessness will be revealed, whose activity is in accordance with Satan, with powers, signs, and false wonders, nesim beniflaot, with all the deceptions of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive a love of the truth. For this reason, the Lord will send upon them a deluding influence to make them believe what is false, in order that they may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. When the apostasy happens, God in judgment is going to send a delusion to cause people to believe error, the way that he put a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of King Ahab and the story of Micaiah in the book of Kings. The Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe what is false. The entire context supports it being a departure from the truth. Moreover, the epistles explain the gospels. The apostles explain the teaching of Jesus. We may think of the epistles as inspired commentary. Second Thessalonians is explaining a portion of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Luke 21, etc., where Jesus warned of an apostasy that is a falling away from the truth in the last days. Many will fall away and betray one another. People will go after false prophets and so forth. Well, let's look at this further. 
the prefix apo, has a certain meaning. Keep away from that brother. Go outside of this. Don't go near it. We have to look at apo before we look at apostemi. And we have to look at the same epistle before we look at the book of Acts or anywhere else. Secondly, we have to look at the co-text. Where else does Paul use this term in relation to the last days? Well, the answer to that is in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Apo stays on thy. This notion that the apostasy of the rapture, not even believed by most pre-tribulationists, is one of the most silly and ridiculous propositions I've ever heard in my life. Now, I don't say this by way of any personal vitriol. Dr. Thomas Ice, its chief propagator at the present time, is somebody who I've largely respected in many ways for many reasons. As I pointed out multiple times, he has authored the quintessential book refuting the errors of dominion theology. He's a very credible author and scholar in terms of certain doctrines. But when it comes to his handling of this text, it is exegetically irresponsible. I have much common ground with many of my tree, trib brethren, with many pre-trib brethren. The restrainer being the Holy Spirit. I agree with Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum that the great tribulation will not happen until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is. I certainly agree with Mark Hitchcock that if the apostasy was the rapture, the word would be hard pencil. But I cannot agree with Thomas Ice. Either can most of the pre-tribulational people I know who I've spoken to about this issue. The majority of them accomplished authors and expositors in their own right. Again, we've spoke of this in terms of the pre-tribulational research group being a house divided. There is a falling away in the last days. The whole-scale departure from the truth we've seen in major evangelical denominations, major supposedly evangelical figures now, like Tony Campolo and Steve Chalk, endorsing same-sex marriage. We've seen compromise on the ecumenical issue, on people who believe in other gospel. We have seen counterfeit revivals that traditional Pentecostals would never sanction much apostasy. And the apostasy we see is a sign of the return of Jesus. It is what he warned of in the Olivet Discourse. And it is setting the stage, setting the stage for the coming apostasy that will culminate with the ascent of the Antichrist, who will deceive both the Jews and the apostate church. Again, my willingness to publicly debate Dr. Thomas Ice on the definition of the apostasy from the Greek text is something I state categorically only on the condition that it be filmed, live streamed on the internet, and be attended by scholars of reputable report who are familiar with the Greek text. What he's teaching is absolutely absurd. God bless him. I appreciate the many good things he's done. But to call the apostasy the rapture, or the rapture an apostasy, is beyond ludicrous. It is dangerously ludicrous. No, the apostasy is a falling away from the truth.
Titus chapter 2, verse 13, we read, Prostekomenai, seeking with expectation. Ten makarion elpida, the blessed hope, kai epithenion, and what we translate as the appearance. But that term, epithenion, prefix epi, around, phenion, similar to the word epiphany. It's where we get the word epiphany or epiphanus. We become aware of something that has appeared. Something may have been looming, but now it has fully appeared, and it's all around, and it's evident. Epiphanion. It is synonymous almost with the word parousia, is appearing, appearing as being revealed. But epiphanion goes beyond that. It be means widely apparent. It's all over. The epiphanion, te doke, of his glory. Tau megaloteo, our great God, kai soteros amon Jesu Christo and God, Jesus Christ, or actually Christ Jesus. When the scripture says Jesus Christ, it's him on earth. Here it is Christ Jesus, it's him in eternity. The Epiphanion. The blessed hope. What does this verse literally mean? What is the blessed hope of the New Testament? What is Paul trying to explain or assert under the direct inspiration of the Holy Spirit? What is he writing Titus when he addresses this subject in his epistle to Titus chapter 2? What exactly does the Word of God mean by the blessed hope? What is our blessed hope? Let's read the epistle to Titus. Chapter 2, commencing in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The blessed hope. Now notice the term harpezo, rapture, does not occur in the original Greek text or in any valid English translation. The term is rather parousia, appearing. Paul equates the blessed hope with the appearing of the Lord. Let's look at it once again in chapter 2, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. At that parousia, at that point, we have his appearing. Did Titus have the blessed hope? Certainly he did. Did the Apostle Paul have the blessed hope? Certainly he did. Was Titus raptured? No. Was Paul raptured? Well, he had a kind of rapture experience that he records in 2 Corinthians, but he returned to earth. He was not raptured in the eschatological or last days sense of the word. No, Paul was not raptured and either was Titus. Yet they had the blessed hope. So if Paul and Titus both had the blessed hope but were not raptured, there is no way that the blessed hope can equal the rapture. Moreover, the term rapture is not in the text. The term appearing is. 
When a believer goes to be with the Lord before the rapture, as it were, they fall asleep. Although their soul, their spirit is in the conscious presence of God, their body is asleep in the earth, waiting for the resurrection, the last trumpet. When Jesus returns, they raise from the dead. Their body and soul are reintegrated, and they meet those who are raptured in the air. We come out as one. The dead in Christ rise first. This takes place at his appearing, the parousia. This is our blessed hope. If you go to be with the Lord by natural means before the rapture, you still have the blessed hope. Unfortunately, we have brethren in Christ, sincere people, who are teaching that the blessed hope equals the rapture, that we have to believe in the imminency of the rapture as an impetus to live morally, that that is the blessed hope. This is complete and utter nonsense. Otherwise, the blessed hope would have failed both Timothy and Paul. No, we all have the blessed hope. A believer at any time in history has the blessed hope. Now let me make clear, I am absolutely convinced that this present age in history is different from the other times in history when sincere believers thought it was the last days. The countries that were at the center of world events in scripture are at the center of the world events again, including Israel and the Jews. We see the reconfederation of the countries in the Roman Empire. Without doubt, the European Union is at least the embryo of what Daniel predicted. The apostasy and the ecumenical movement in the church, again, what the Olivet Discourse predicts. This time in history is uniquely different than other times in history when true believers thought it was the last days. I have no doubt we're in the last days and that Jesus is coming soon. I have no doubt I've never believed anything other in all of my Christian life. However, that is not the blessed hope. The blessed hope is not the rapture. The blessed hope is his appearing, his coming, whether we are asleep in the Lord or whether we are alive and are raptured. The blessed hope appears to those who are already asleep in the Lord as much as it applies to those who are to be raptured. Let's look what Paul tells the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in verse 13. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that is, those who died in Christ, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Those who fall asleep in the Lord have the hope. It's the unsaved who have no hope. We cannot say that the blessed hope is the rapture because that would mean that those who go to be with the Lord by natural means don't have a blessed hope. They do have a blessed hope. Paul does not say, never says, the blessed hope is limited to the rapture. It is the parousia. It is the resurrection, that is the anesthesia, and it is the harpezo, that is the rapture, which are virtually concurrent events. The dead in Christ rise first, and those raptured meet them in the air at his appearance, the parousia. This is the blessed hope. All true believers have it, whether they die of natural means, that is, fall asleep in the Lord, or whether they're alive when the Lord comes and are raptured, we all have it. In no sense whatsoever, in absolutely no sense, can anyone exegetically equate or define the blessed hope as the rapture. It will include the rapture. But that's not what it is. It is not limited to the rapture by any means. It could co-equally be the resurrection. We all have it, whether we're alive or asleep in the Lord when he comes. This is a rather irresponsible invention without any exegetical foundation 
by those who are propagating a pre-tribulational position of the rapture. Now, many true believers hold to this position, and I'm not saying that they are malmotivated. They're not. Many sincere people who love the Lord hold this view. But the view is wrong. The blessed hope is not the rapture. The blessed hope, we are told, is the parousia, his appearance. They go on to say other things. The doctrine of imminency. Believing that the Lord can come at any time and rapture the church is the impetus to live morally and righteously according to Titus, they say. Do I believe that the Lord Jesus can come at any moment? I believe that the Lord Jesus can come at any moment for me, or he can come at any moment for you. He can come for any of us personally, at any time. He can come tonight, tomorrow morning, five minutes from now. Irrespective of when the timing of the rapture is. The doctrine of imminency, in no sense whatsoever, depends on the timing of the rapture. The Lord can come at any time for anyone, and we should live our lives as believers accordingly. Imminency does not depend on a pre-tribulation rapture or any other timing of the rapture. Imminency depends on the fact that none of us knows how long we have in this temporal life. It's silly to say that that passage is only for believers who are going to be alive in the last days before the rapture. Because the way Paul writes, it applies to himself and it applies to Titus. Nearly 2,000 years ago it applied. It applies to all believers at all times. Yet we have this nonsensical invention that is devoid of any firm exegetical basis or any linguistic basis in the Greek language that imminency depends on the doctrine of the rapture's timing being pre-tribulational and that the blessed hope equals the rapture. Both claims are nonsense and without any doctrinal foundation whatsoever. It is pseudo-theology. It is false eschatology. Now, I firmly believe in the rapture. I firmly believe we're in the last days that the Lord is coming. But when he comes, those who've already fallen asleep in the Lord will as much have the blessed hope as those who are alive when he gets here. Imminency? We should be living holy, moral lives at any time in history irrespective of whether or not we're in the last days of the first century church, because the Lord can come at any time for anyone. Now, the reason that they have concocted this nonsense, despite the fact that it has no exegetical foundation, is because they have a convoluted hermeneutic. They engage in pseudo-exegetical acrobatics to get around the clear and plain teaching of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the episunagage are gathering together to be with the Lord, whether by rapture or by resurrection, whether by anesthesia or by harpezo, will not happen until the faithful church knows who the Antichrist is, and they will go to extravagant lengths to try to circumvent the plain meaning of the text. One of the lengths they go to is to redefine blessed hope as rapture or equate it with the rapture, when in fact we are told it is the parousia and we are told all believers at all times in history have had the blessed hope because of the resurrection. Paul says that directly to the church in Thessalonica. But there's more. We read the following again in Titus. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Many of the people who propagate pre-tribulational beliefs, such as Dr. Thomas Ice or John MacArthur, they hold to Calvinistic dogma. 
John Calvin taught that Jesus did not die for everyone, that he only died for the elect. But in speaking of the blessed hope, Paul tells us that the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Now, all men will not receive salvation, but God is willing to save all, even though he foreknows those who will and who will not accept his offer of salvation based on grace, based on the atonement of Jesus and his resurrection. This passage, verse 11 through verse 14 of Titus chapter 2, is vital. It's one of the passages that debunks Calvinistic presupposition, particularly five-point Calvinism, particularly the false doctrine of particularism or limited atonement that says that Jesus did not die for everyone. But it also shows us that the blessed hope is the parousia, his appearing. It is not limited to the rapture. It could co-equally be the resurrection. The Lord can come at any time for any of us, and we should live accordingly, irrespective of the timing of the rapture, even though I certainly believe in the rapture and that the time of his appearing is drawing closer. Now, I share these things with a love for the Lord and a love for the church. I have no hostility to any believer who subscribes to these errors. There are sincere people I know who are honest in their intent, who love the Lord, who've been mistaught that the rapture is the blessed hope and the blessed hope is the rapture, who have been mistaught that imminency is a pre-trib rapture, and a pre-trib rapture is imminent. That is not what the scripture says. That is not the definition of the blessed hope, and it's not what the word of God means by imminency. The Lord is indeed coming. He's coming soon. But he may come for any of us sooner than we even think irrespective of when the rapture takes place. This is the meaning. We have the blessed hope. If you are a believer who is terminally ill and the Lord's purpose is not to heal you but to take you home, you still have the blessed hope. Even though you will not be raptured, you'll be resurrected. You'll be part of the same event at his appearing, the parousia. You still have the blessed hope. Let no pre-tribulationist tell you otherwise. Imminency? The motive to live a godly, moral, sensible life does not depend on when the rapture takes place. It depends on the fact that none of us ever know how long we have in this temporal world. This is what the Word of God teaches linguistically and exegetically. I challenge any pre-tribulational Bible expositor to publicly debate me on this issue. Prove to me, exegetically, on the basis of the Greek text, that the blessed hope equals the rapture, that the doctrine of imminency depends on the timing of the rapture. They do not. But my offer stands, not out of contention, but out of love. God's people need to know the truth. Now, finally, friends, by way of clarification, I am not saying that only Calvinistic people hold to a pre-tribulational rapture position. That is not true. There are non-Calvinists who hold to it. As a matter of fact, Calvinists debate among themselves, did John Calvin really teach particularism? Did John Calvin himself really believe that the Lord only died for the elect, that he didn't die for everyone and is willing to receive everyone? By the elect, they mean those who are predestined. Not all Calvinists hold to the fourth point of the tulip of Beza. I'm not saying there's any 
continuity between Calvinistic belief and pre-tribulationism. I'm simply saying many of the leaders of pre-tribulational thought come from a Calvinistic background, and this same passage addresses both issues. Secondly, once again, Paul had the blessed hope. Titus had the blessed hope. Timothy had the blessed hope. The people who Paul discipled and his team had the blessed hope, as did the other apostles, Peter, James, and John. Nothing to do with the rapture. Right back to the first century, they all have the blessed hope. Paul, Titus, Timothy, Peter, James, John, Luke, Mark, and so do I, and so do you. Most of my pre-tribulational friends will speak of the father of pre-tribulationism with some regard, even affection. I speak, of course, of Mr. John Nelson Darby from the 19th century. His ideas were later codified by others, including Mr. Schofield, but Mr. Darby is generally regarded as the founder of modern dispensationalism in its conventional sense, although the others believed versions of it at the same time or earlier than he did, and certainly its pre-tribulational ideas concerning the return of Jesus eschatologically. John Nelson Darby. And again, they speak of him with a very high sense of regard. But too often, most of them have no sense about what he really was, what he really believed, and why he was so unpopular among major respected evangelicals of his era, including other dispensationalists. People are often shocked when I point out that Charles Spurgeon took out full-page ads in newspapers in London warning people against John Nelson Darby. Why did Charles Spurgeon publicly warn people against him? Why did George Mueller, the great Christian activist on behalf of the poor children and evangelist to the homeless youth, why did George Mueller react publicly so strongly against John Nelson Darby? Why is it that D.L. Moody, the American evangelist, had such a low view of John Nelson Darby? Why did so many of the early people in the Brethren movement, such as James Grant, or the greatest Brethren scholar with an earned doctorate in Greek, Dr. Samuel Tregelis, much more formally educated in scripture and biblical languages than Darby, was Dr. Tregelis. And why did not only George Mueller, but so many of these other people like uh, Benjamin Newton, these are all early brethren people who were with Mr. Darby from the beginning, why did they all utterly, utterly repudiate him? Why did they all publicly distance themselves from him and even warn against him, even in full-page ads? Why did Spurgeon seem so keen to warn the Christian public to keep away from John Darby? Why did D.L. Moody dislike him? Why did George Mueller distrust him and dislike him? Why did major evangelical luminaries of the era, including other dispensationalists, including many of the founders of the Brethren Movement, all warn people against John Darby? There's always been controversy surrounding him. Undoubtedly, at the Power Court conferences in Dublin, he had contact with some of the Irvingites, an early charismatic movement that may have began well, but certainly went off the rails at an early point, as would later happen in Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Whether or not Mr. Darby adopted their ideas or not is often disputed, but that is not the point. We know what Mr. Darby was and what he did. Many cults, Adventist-type cults, began springing up in the 19th century. The Jehovah's Witnesses, beginning as the Dawn's Bible Society, began at that time. Mormonism began early in the 19th 
century. Seventh-day Adventism began early in the 19th century and gained momentum. And so, of course, did the closed brethren, the exclusive brethren. We can speak of Joseph Smith or Brigham Young. We can speak of Charles Tazzy Russell or Rutherford. We can speak of Ellen G. White, and everyone would know that they are cult founders and cult leaders. But so was John Nelson Darby. The closed brethren, the exclusive brethren, exist until this day. There's over 40,000 of them in Great Britain. They're in New Zealand, Australia, other countries, but in Britain, 40,000. And like any other cult, they divide families. They can destroy marriages and do so. They are an utter cult. Mainstream brethren groups from Plymouth Brethren backgrounds, mainstream brethren groups warn against them, just as so many of the early brethren leaders, such as George Mueller, James Grant, Benjamin Newton, Dr. Samuel Tregalis, and other leaders of the early brethren warned against Darby. It's still going on. The open brethren are warning against the closed brethren. They are, in every sense of the word, a cult. It is irrefutable, undeniable, that John Darby was a cult leader. Now, when one understands dispensationalism, theologically and philosophically, nothing could be more contrary to dispensational thought than sprinkling infants and calling that baptism. A real dispensationalist wouldn't do that. They do not see an equivalency between the Hebrew rite of circumcision and infant baptism. Baptism is for believers, for those who are born again. Yet John Darby's followers to this day follow Mr. Darby's teaching to sprinkle infants. While claiming to be a dispensationalist, he's doing something completely anti-dispensational. He's sprinkling babies and calling these infants Christians. One of the most damaging things we can do is to baptize a baby and tell them that they're a Christian when they've not been born again as they grow up. Or you can confuse them by telling them they must be born again after they've been baptized as a baby. We're told in Romans we're baptized into the Lord's death. Nobody would take a baby out of a crib and put it into a casket and bury it if it wasn't dead. When you baptize an infant, you're telling someone they're a Christian when they're not. And then you have to explain why they need to become one. You're confusing them. It's totally unscriptural. Infant baptism is not biblical. But Mr. Darby, while claiming to be a dispensationalist, practiced it, taught it, and his followers do so to this day. How many people who are pre-tribulational believe in sprinkling infants and calling that baptism, as Mr. Darby did? How many subscribe to exclusivism, the sin of party spirit, saying that they're the one true church? I'm not speaking of Roman Catholicism's claims. I'm speaking of the claims of John Nelson Darby's followers. They claim to be the true body of Christ. And it has spurned other groups that others have called cultic, such as Witness Lee's followers, the local church. But they came from that same idea. They were all influenced by Darby, directly or indirectly. This man was a cult leader, and he did sprinkle infants. But now let's get into serious, serious heresy. How many of the people who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture would say that the epistle of James is not for the church? It's part of the Old Testament, and it's only for the Jews. How many pre-tribulation people who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture would say that the Gospels, the Sermon on the Mount, the Olivet Discourse are not for Christians, therefore Old Testament Israel? That the Gospels are part of the Old Testament. They're not for the church. That teaching is known as hyper-dispensationalism. 
and it influenced somebody called E.W. Bullinger who reformulated it into something called Bullingerism that was opposed by the great American pastor and Bible expositor Harry Ironside who challenged Bullingerism. But the source of Bullingerism was the false doctrine of John Nelson Darby. Hyper-dispensationalism. It basically was a sanitized form of the ancient errors of Marcionism, drawing a radical distinction between the, the Testaments based on a wrong view of God. The Darbyists would believe that there's a different dispensation of grace now than existed in the first century. That the era of the church per se as it exists now began with Paul, not with Pentecost. That was a different era. That's what they teach. And from this, they derive such views as cessationism, finding a bedfellow in certain Calvinistic schools of thought that were initially founded by Benjamin Warfield, B.B. Warfield, the idea that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles. Well, Darby's followers followed that. How can a Pentecostal preacher, a Pentecostal pastor, follow Darby? when Darby said that you are a teacher of error and a deceiver because you believe the gifts of the Spirit still exist in the church. It's automatically contradictory. How can you be Pentecostal or charismatic and believe in Darby? Darby would have called you heretical. He was a cessationist. He believed that major portions of the New Testament, certainly the Epistle of James and the Gospels, were part of the Old Testament, not for the church. And from this, he gets the idea that the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Luke 21, etc., that's for the Jews, not for the church. This is the root of his pre-tribulational thinking. Oh, that stuff is for the Jews. It's not for the church about the return of Christ. We won't be here. That's where it comes from. Now, I know that most people who are pre-tribulationists don't sprinkle babies. Most people who are pre-tribulationists don't subscribe to exclusivism or the sin of party spirits. Most people who are pre-tribulationists do not believe the epistle of James is part of the Old Testament or that the Gospels are for the Jews, they're part of the Old Testament, not for the church. They don't believe that. They find such views heretical. Yet they follow Mr. Darby, who taught and practiced all of these things. Face the fact, if you're pre-tribulational, you are following a cult leader. You are found, following a man who founded a cult, a real cult, a cult that still exists. In Britain, our ministry once had a woman saved, born again, who was 34 years in Darby's cult, the closed brethren, and didn't know she wasn't saved because she was sprinkled as an infant and brought up in that cult. 34 years in it and wasn't born again. Darby's real followers don't even consider you to be a Christian if you're not in their group very often, or at least, at best, a very misguided one. And if you're charismatic or Pentecostal, forget about it. Your theology does not make a lot of sense. You're following somebody who would have taught against what you are and what you believe. It is a theology that is cultic. Darby was despotic. Charles Spurgeon, his contemporary, knew that and warned against him. George Mueller, a great saint of God, who himself was brethren and dispensational, knew that and warned against him. So did many others. Theo Moody just did not like him, with good reason. These are great men of God who knew Darby, who were his contemporaries, and warned the church, keep away from that man. Well, I'm only telling you today what Spurgeon 
told Christians. We're only telling you today what James Grant told Christians. We're only telling you today what George Mueller told Christians concerning John Nelson Darby. His doctrines are dangerous and false. He's a cult leader. Keep away from that man. God bless. There is no verse or passage that teaches a pre-trib rapture by their own admission. The intellectual patriarch of modern pre-tribulationism undoubtedly has been the late Dr. John Wolverine, a great Greek scholar and a very solid believer, former president of Dallas Seminary, again, a man of considerable integrity and of academic worth. Yet he admitted in writing, Dr. Wolverine admitted, there is no passage that teaches a pre tribulation rapture. None. It is not in there. It is something that you must glean from an overview of Scripture. Another pre-tribulationist who's gone into very significant error, who's gone into heretical deception as a pre-tribulationist is John MacArthur. John MacArthur states that the pre-trib rapture is between the lines of Scripture. That's not there. You have to read it in between the lines. The climactic event of premillennial history has to be deduced from what's between the lines and not stated. Notice, none of them can point it out. They admit it's not in there. To base a doctrine on something not in there is not only irresponsible, it is almost crazy. We can have views. We can have opinions. But we can't base doctrine on it. For instance, in my personal view, as best I can see, my fallible human opinion, there seems to me Concerning Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, a situation where there may be two battles of Gog and Magog. We interpret the Old Testament in the light of the New, and the New Testament tells us at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, at the end of the thousand years, Satan will be temporarily unloosed, and there will be a battle of Gog and Magog. Because that's the one that's stated in the New Testament, that must be the main one. However, it seems to me there could be a second, actually a chronological first battle of Gog and Magog that will foreshadow and typify the one at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. It seems to me there could be two battles of Gog and Magog. But I cannot be dogmatic about it. It just seems to me that could be the case. I can't make a doctrine of it or divide over it. If you disagree with me and think there's only one, maybe you're right. God bless you. I don't fully understand it yet. But it seems to me there could be two battles of Gog and Magog. One that is before the millennial reign of Christ and one that is after. It seems to me that is my view, my opinion. But it's based on deduction, not induction. It is based not on exegesis. It's just a sanctified opinion. Now that's fine, as long as I'm not dogmatic about it or framing it as a doctrine or saying there's something wrong with you if you don't agree with me. If you don't agree with me, maybe you're right. However, when it comes to the rapture, the same rules apply. They cannot show you a single passage. They can only give you an opinion. That goes back to Mr. Schofield and Mr. Darby, Dr. Wolverd, Tim LaHaye, Thomas Ice, T.A. McMahon. None of them can show you where the pre-trib rapture takes place because they themselves 
admit it is not in there. They've got a problem. They've got a major problem. I mentioned John MacArthur saying it's between the lines. And based on his pre-tribulational position that is defended by people like Dr. Phil Johnson, his nemesis to me is Phil Johnson, who opposes my opposition to the teaching of John MacArthur concerning what will happen at the end of the age. What is this that makes me such a nemesis to him? in his defense of John MacArthur. What is it that Phil Johnson has the problem with? His problem is, I publicly challenge John MacArthur's false teaching as heretical and dangerous, that it will be possible after the rapture to take the mark of the beast, to worship the Antichrist, that is to worship Satan incarnate virtually, to worship the image of the beast, taking the mark, without which no one can buy or sell, and still be saved and go to heaven. That's what John MacArthur teaches. You can worship the Antichrist, take the mark of the beast, and still get saved and go to heaven. It is a position supported by other people who are false teachers and dangerous men, such as Jimmy DeYoung. This is dangerous. We read in Revelation chapter 14 the following. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And now Taoyones, they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. The smoke of their torment goes up from age to ages, forever and ever. Who which, whoever worships the beast and receives the mark of his name. John MacArthur says, no, there'll be people who take the mark of the beast worship the Antichrist, and can still be saved during the tribulation. One error leads to another one. Now John MacArthur has gone from being in mere error to being in open heresy and direct rebellion against the plain teaching of the Word of God. Anybody who says it's possible to worship the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast is a dangerous man. And anyone who defends a man like MacArthur, like Phil Johnson, is as dangerous as he is. This itself is apostasy. It's a departure from the truth. It's apostemi. Traditional pre-tribulation people have never taught this. With all due respect to Tim LaHaye, Tim LaHaye, he's a man who God has used in the lives of many people. I do not question this. And again, he's a man whom I like personally. But he has this idea that the rapture is going to trigger a great revival among those who miss it. This is crazy. The book of Revelation tells us, during the wrath of God, and at a time when judgments begin to multiply, men still did not re repent of their evil deeds. It doesn't say that there's going to be a revival. The fact of the matter is, the overwhelming mass of what the scriptures teach concerning what happens after the rapture indicates that God has turned his prophetic and redemptive purposes centrally and focally back to Israel and the Jews. The overwhelming mass of what takes place on planet Earth once the faithful church has been resurrected and raptured, when the wrath of God happens, the overwhelming mass of what the scriptures indicate is going to happen shows God returning his focus and purpose to dealing with Israel and the Jews. That is why we see the motifs of the book of Exodus replayed in the book of Revelation, still commemorated in the Paschal Seder, Hoshech, darkness, frogs, fardaya, dam, blood, etc. The way Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron, Jonas and Jambres, that is the way the Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. 
That's what the Antichrist and false prophet are going to do. They're going to imitate Jonas and John Brace. It goes back to an Old Testament motif. Grace has come to an end. Now he's the God of wrath and judgment as he was in the Old Testament. And his focus is once again on Israel and the Jews. Not the church. The church is gone. There is no church per se. This doctrine of the tribulation saints is amplified out of all proportion to anything the scriptures say. Based on a presupposition, we're going to be raptured before any of this happens, so everything the scripture says about the saints at that time doesn't apply to us. Oh, yes, it does. Calvinists, particularly Calvinists who are pre-tribulationists or who claim to be Calvinists, conveniently do something. They follow Beza's doctrine of perseverance of the saints. Don't worry about apostasy or falling away. It's unconditional. Once saved, always saved. Now, I believe there's a perseverance of the saints, and I do believe we're eternally secure in Christ, but I also believe there's a falling away. Revelation 14 tells us in verse 12, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. That is the only place the term perseverance of the saints is found in Scripture. It is a prophecy about believers at that time in history, in coming prophetic history. It's a prophecy about these believers at a coming time. That's the only place the term perseverance of the saints occurs. But of course, Mr. Beza redefined it with his tulip and says it means unconditional, once saved, always saved. That's not what perseverance of the saints says it means. That's not what it's even about. The whole thing is a nonsense, a complete and utter nonsense. They're reading things into Scripture. It doesn't say. Show me where perseverance of the saints means anything other than it says in Revelation 12. Show me. I challenge you. Show me where it says there is a pre-tribulation rapture. Show me. It doesn't say it. Your own patriarchs admit it. It's just not there. Show me, Mr. Magatha, how somebody can worship the Antichrist and take the number of the beast and still be saved. Show me when the scripture says directly the diametric opposites. We have to extrapolate doctrine? That's Roman Catholicism. That's the census plenier. That's Gnosticism, spiritualizing texts out of context. I don't deny typology. I don't deny uses of Jewish midrash in the early Christian writings. But you cannot base doctrine on symbolism or extrapolation. It's just not there. It's not there at all. Never has been. If God wanted it there, he would have put it there, but he didn't. You can have opinion. Providing your opinion does not contradict what's plainly stated the way that John MacArthur's opinion directly contradicts what is plainly stated. You think about it. Jesus said, be alert, watch out for these signs. Rick Warren says, no, don't be alert. It's a diversion. You either believe Rick Warren or Jesus Christ. And the revelation that was given to John, it says, whoever worships the image of the beast and takes the mark of his name, the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. No, says John Magatha. Those people can be saved and born again. After the tribulation happens, they can still be saved even if they worship the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast. You either believe Jesus Christ or you believe John MacArthur. You cannot believe both. You're either going to believe Jesus Christ or Philip Johnson. You cannot believe both. One of them has a lying spirit. One of them is deceived and is being used of Satan to deceive others and set them up for something terrible. It is beyond irresponsible to set people up 
believing that it will be possible to take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. Yet that's what's being taught by masters. That's what's being taught by John MacArthur. And it comes from his pre-trib root. It's just not there. Pre-trib is not there. Dr. Walbert admitted it's not there. Darby and Schofield invented these things. God did not put it in his word. They admit it must be extrapolated. A house divided against itself cannot stand. We no longer have a situation where it is pre-tribulation people at odds with those who are not pre-tribulation. We're way past that. Now we have pre-tribulation people at odds with themselves. Now again, I respect Mark Hitchcock. I tremendously respect Arnold Schruchtenbaum. They're both saying many true things. At least they're being honest with the text or trying to be. Certainly Arnold is. But to say the apostasy is the rapture? This is crazy. This is crazy. The word would be hard paid so. It wouldn't be apostasy. The Epi Sunagage are gathering together around him. Epi, around. Sunagage, we'll get the word synagogue, are gathering together. <clears throat> is the harpezo, that is the snatching away, the rapture, and the anesthesia, the resurrection together. That's the return of Jesus at the parousia. The true sons of God are revealed with him in glory. That's what it is. It will not happen until the great falling away comes first. You cannot say the rapture won't happen until the rapture happens first or something of this nature. It doesn't even make much sense, does it? The underlying word, apostemi, where else it is used in scripture in a prophetic context concerning the last days, which is in Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 shows it means the fall away from the truth. Even other pre-tribulation people don't agree with what Thomas Ice is saying. When they had their conferences in Dallas, I suppose they have to focus on their common opponent. Because if they tried to resolve these issues among themselves, they would have a free-for-all. It's easy when they're debating somebody into obvious doctrinal error, such as Hank Hanegraaff. It's easy when they're trying to unite against the people, the many people, who are realizing that pre-tribulationism is wrong and baseless. But I would challenge those people at Dallas, many of whom are my friends at that conference, Deal with the issue. Is Arnold Fruchtenbaum right that the Antichrist has to be identified before the tribulation? I think he is. In fact, I'm sure he is. Is traditional pre-tribulationism right in saying, no, the apostasy is a falling away, it is not the rapture? Or is the newfangled Thomas Ice access the correct one, saying the apostasy is the rapture? There is a book called The Rapture Handbook where different views are presented. It's not a handbook. There are contradictory positions within it by the contributing authors. It is a house divided against itself and it cannot stand. God bless.